the team against the motion, Todd Buchholz, former White House Director of Economic Policy under George H.W. Bush. His partner, Otmar Issing, former chief economist of the European Central Bank. The team arguing for the motion, Stephanie Kelton, professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and a leading authority on modern monetary theory. And James Galbraith, economist and professor of public affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. Here are their opening statements. Do large national deficits drive up interest rates in countries that pay debts in their own uh, currency? Obviously not. Japan has a national debt twice GDP and interest rate on government debt that's negative. In France, it's almost 100 percent. The interest rate is, again, negative. In the United States, uh, the 20-year constant maturity rate, treasury rate was about 1.4 percent just now, and the 10-year uh, rate is below 0.9 percent, which is an even better deal than Pope Julius got from Michelangelo for the Sistine Chapel. And those are market rates. Efficient markets theory tells us that they reflect the expectation of inflation over 10 or 20 years to come. That expectation could be wrong, but it is not open to economists who purport to believe in efficient markets uh, to question it. What about the dollar? Sure, the dollar might decline some in the years ahead. If so, America, goods Americans buy will be more expensive, American jobs will be more plentiful, and, and they will sell better on world markets. That's an internal matter. Could the dollar collapse? The thought is absurd. In every world crisis, investors have come into the dollar, not out of it. That is because there is no safer alternative, certainly not the euro for which uh, Germany gave up the Deutsche Mark 21 years ago. America's worries are unemployment, climate change, COVID-19, inequality, precarity, the polarization of our society, uh, militarism, the threat of wars. America's goals are full employment, balanced growth, and reasonable price stability. Those are written into law. As Keynes said, anything we can actually do, we can afford. If you haven't started worrying about deficits, don't start. If you have started, stop. Vote for sound economics and for your mental health. Let us consider the facts. To a large extent, the public debt figures of industrialized countries today are coming close, fairly close to the levels reached after World War II. However, these already frightening figures are only the tip of the iceberg. The greater part of the public debt is not visible. In Germany, for example, the official figure for the ratio of public debt to gross domestic product is now 72%. If you add the obligations for future social spending from pensions to health care, the number rises to a staggering over 400%. Similar ratios apply to many other countries. A person born into the, one of these societies arrives with a heavy load to bear. On top of all the future challenges arising from climate change or aging populations. High public debt implies limits to future expenditures and once interest rates rise, the house of cards will collapse. The federal government is nothing like a household. It shouldn't run its budget the way that you and I run our budgets. If it tries to do so, it almost always ends badly for the economy. It will drive the economy into recession. Governments aren't like households because governments issue the currency and households are what we wanna think of as users of the currency. So I want you to think of a very hard line that separates what the federal government can do with its budget, its spending power, and what the rest of us can do. We play by a different set of rules. That's the first important point. The second important truth is that every deficit is good for someone. The deficit is just the difference between two numbers. The first number is how many dollars the government is spending into the economy each year, and the other number is how many dollars the government is subtracting back out, mostly by taxing us. So a deficit means the government is adding more dollars to our economy than it subtracts away, which means that someone is getting a surplus. 
if you like, the government deficit works to blow financial resources, dollars and government bonds. Those are financial assets that show up on our balance sheets. They become part of our wealth. They're part of our savings. Uh, a, a surplus, when the government eliminates deficits, balances its budget or moves it into surplus, then it's operating its budget like a vacuum. It's hoovering those dollars away from the rest of us, and that reduces our wealth. So think about whether you want the government to be running deficits, which produce your surpluses, or whether you'd prefer them to hoover away some of the financial assets that you hold. The third truth is that deficits can be too big. No one is arguing for unbridled deficit spending, out of control, never ending, larger and larger deficits. Deficits can be too big, and inflation can be evidence of a deficit that's gotten too big. But deficits can also be too small, and evidence of a deficit that is too small is unemployment. That's what we have today, and that's what Dr. Galbraith and I would like to convince you of. Let's worry about the unemployment and the, de and the depressed economy, not the government deficit. The motto or the mascot of modern monetary theory should not be a dollar bill, it should be earplugs, because the modern monetary theorists refuse to listen to 2,000 years of history. Let's go back, ancient Greece, City-states went bankrupt, lending to the Temple of Delos. French Revolution, Louis XVI loses his head. Why? Because he spent too much money. All right, that's old history. Let's go to modern times. Chile, early 1970s. Inflation, Chile, uh, Brazil and Argentina in the 2000s. Bolivia uh, in the 1980s. Okay. They encountered inflation, depreciation, wages fell 40%. Our colleagues say they're worried about everyday people. Wages fell 40% under MMT-like policies. Okay, those are lesser developed nations, perhaps. How about Britain, the 1970s? How could you forget that in the 1970s, Britain begged the IMF for the biggest bailout to date, and James Callaghan? The Labour Prime Minister of Britain explained to the MMT theorists of the day, the predecessors to Dr. Kelton and Dr. Galbraith, we cannot in all candor do what you ask. Okay, Britain, let's put that aside. Let's go to a place that's a little more socialist friendly. Sweden had a terrible crisis in the early 1990s. Have you forgotten that the central bank had to raise interest rates 500%? Have you forgotten that Canada, the Canadian dollar cratered and they could not sell their bonds in the 1990s? In each case, those countries had to slash spending and do what is right. Now, a, a survey was recently done of top economists in the, in the US, many of whom are very worried about inequality, global warming, social welfare state. None of them, not one, supported the principles of MMT. Now, perhaps our colleagues here are like Albert Einstein, a lonely Swiss clerk working by himself, somehow coming up with a magical way that breaks, shatters ideas about space and time. You may decide today whether they are the Einsteins of our day, but in the meantime, I'd suggest vote to be concerned about the deficit and the debt. Vote because our lives depend on it and hold on to your wallet.